Welcome to Government House. It's a pleasure to welcome you as patron to this Royal Society of New South Wales webinar. Indeed, it seems entirely appropriate as we explore our topic tonight with Zoom technology, that the subject of this webinar is all about charting the known and the unknown. In paying my respects to the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, their elders past, present and emerging, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which Government House stands, I acknowledge them and the peoples of the other Indigenous nations of our state, the original explorers of this land and its surrounding waters. Little attention has been given historically to the pivotal role of Bungaree, skilled in diplomacy, an expert linguist and guide from the Eora Nation, in Matthew Flinders' mapping of the Australian coastline, creating, as we know, the first complete map of Australia. Bungaree had sailed with Flinders in 1799 on the Norfolk on the voyage north to Queensland. He then sailed with Flinders on the HMS Investigator, circumnavigating Australia. The journey commenced in 1801, Bungaree again acting as the crew's interpreter and guide, using his knowledge of Aboriginal languages and protocols to negotiate peaceful meetings with local people at various places during the voyage. There is no doubt that Flinders would not have completed the journey or the first map of our continental landmass without Bungaree's assistance, knowledge and skills. Tonight, I greet you from my office here at Government House on the occasion of the inaugural Ideas of the House Lecture. Since becoming Governor in May 2019, I have been keen to explore ways in which the history of Government House, its architecture, its rooms and its grounds can be enjoyed by more people and in different ways. Hence the concept of At the House was born. We have music at the house, including jazz at the house on the first Sunday of each month, that is, when we're not locked down. We welcome all of you to come along to Government House, wander the gardens, sit on the arcade and listen to jazz between 12 and 3.30 on any of those Sundays. With New South Wales at the house, we celebrate the wonderful produce of our state, which, as we know, is unsurpassed in quality. This year, or next, depending upon when we get back into the swing of things, we will principally focus on food and wine from bushfire affected areas. Then there are opportunities at the house where we seek to enhance career and employment opportunities for disadvantaged people in our community and to engage with the business community and educational, medical and scientific research organisations. Which brings me to tonight. Ideas at the House is another of these exciting initiatives. Ideas at the House is intended to engage with matters of broad intellectual interest. New South Wales is home to some of the best academics and experts in the world across many disciplines, and I've found that people from all walks of life are interested in a wide variety of topics, anything from artesian basins to cartography to zoology. In short, I find that we as a community have a thirst for knowledge and we seek out sources which educate us and which make us question and inquire. It is fitting, therefore, that the Royal Society, whose motto is Omnia Quirite, question everything, has taken up the challenge of presenting the first Ideas at the House lecture, with the additional challenge of presenting it remotely. I'm sure you'll find it interesting and stimulating, and I look forward to you joining us for more Ideas at the House, hopefully in person, but if need be remotely, as we are meeting tonight. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your warm welcome to this first ever Ideas at the House. It's uh, wonderful to be here in virtual Government House with our real life patron, the Governor. I'm Ian Sloan, I'm President of the Royal Society of New South Wales. Uh, I want to begin by paying my respect also to the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and to all Indigenous peoples of New South Wales and to their elders, past, present and emerging. They're the custodians of knowledge which has been gathered over thousands of years. So the Royal Society of New South Wales has been around a long time, at least by the standards of organised societies. It started life as the Philosophical Society of Australasia and next month will celebrate its 199th birthday. It played a vigorous role in the early, in the scientific uh, life of early New South Wales, the colony, 
and he continues to make a significant contribution to the intellectual life of New South Wales and Australia. But his scope is now broader than, than science. Science, certainly, but the Royal Society now covers, according to its act of incorporation, science, art, literature, and philosophy, which I think means everything of intellectual interest. And the governor said his motto is question everything. It's also broadened its, uh, its notion of membership. It may once have been a, a gentleman's club, but it's no longer a gentleman's club. It's, it's proud of its policy of diversity and inclusion. We welcome as members people of all genders and all backgrounds, all who are interested in ideas. Robert Clancy tonight has an, an extraordinary range of interests, ranging from pandemics to maps. He was the foundation professor of pathology at the University of Newcastle School of Medicine. Uh, but he also has a wide reputation in cartography, particularly the maps of early Australia. Is the, unbelievably, is the author of five books on cartography. We are proud to have him as a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales. Before I ask Robert to speak, I want to say that there will be a question and answer session at the end of Robert's talk. It will be conducted by Bryn Hibbert, our vice president and immediate past president. And you can post questions at any time throughout the lecture. Don't wait to, to, until the end, get in early. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Robert Clancy, AM, FRSN, who will speak on the mapping of colonial Australia. Thank you, Robert. Good evening and welcome to this first presentation in the series Ideas at the House. I think this is a fantastic idea. Uh, it was conceived by Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, our Governor of New South Wales, uh, and co-sponsored by the Royal Society of New South Wales. And I'm hoping this connection will become a little clearer in the talk I'm going to give. It's a great pleasure and honour for me to be giving this presentation. Uh, I was invited to talk about the mapping of New South Wales, and I thought I'd talk about the mapping in relation to colonial New South Wales. I have to say, it's a rather strange experience talking to a computer. I've never done this before, and I never quite understood and realised how important it is to have a, a live audience, but here we go. Now, what I'm going to do is present the maps in relation to the governors of the time. And I'm going to focus particularly on the governors between the beginning of colonisation with Captain Arthur Phillip and the development of responsible government uh, in the mid 1850s. And there are three reasons why I want to do that. The first is that it is that time when most of the ideas and issues that set the way in which the colony was going to develop and the country was going to develop occurred in that period. The second reason is the governors in those days were more singular in the sense that they related to the issues more directly than perhaps at a later time when issues became more complicated and democracy spread responsibility a little further. And finally, this was a period when governors and the Royal Society came together. And I hope this comes fairly clear that in 1821 with Governor Brisbane, he not only brought science to Australia, but he initiated the conversation and communication through the Australian Philosophical Society, which of course was the precursor to our own society. If you look at the screen, you'll notice that there are autocratic and democratic governors, which doesn't really relate to whether an individual was autocratic or democratic, but rather the fact that at a particular point, there was uh, the development of a legislature and that uh, there was um, uh, a, a dilution, if you like, of the, the governor's uh, uh, power base. And so we can really identify in a more singular fashion the contributions of particular governors uh, in the period before responsible government. You'll also notice on the slide that I've identified Macquarie as a link between the autocratic and the democratic governors. 
Uh, we think of Governor Macquarie in many ways as a, a remarkable person, but we don't often think of him as a person who was instrumental in an indirect fashion uh, of uh, involving and developing a democratic process uh, within the uh, colonial New South Wales government. You'll also note that I've got Aboriginal maps dating back 30,000 years. And while this talk is not specifically on Aboriginal maps, I think it's very important to remember that mapping of New South Wales goes back a long, long time. If we look at Aboriginal maps, uh, we need to know that from the 1930s, we recognise that Aboriginal people had a very clear understanding of the boundaries of their territories. The art that they do that we all know and like uh, is highly topographic and it's also highly symbolised. There are great regional variations and maps, as always, are about place. Uh, and direction uh, for the Aboriginal group was very much involved in the astronomy and usage of stars, which we don't have time to really talk about uh, today. I've put in this very interesting picture. It, it's a, an art piece that was done by two Australian artists, uh, a European background Australian and an Aboriginal background Australian. And they were both looking at exactly the same piece of territory. And they decided they would draw and paint that particular piece in the way in which they saw it. And you'll see that there's a pen and wash, a very classical uh, European style uh, drawing, uh, which is superimposed by the symbolic way in which that Aboriginal artist saw exactly the same piece of topography. And I think that's an extremely important idea and concept uh, to keep in mind. Now, that was, of course, uh, Central Australia. Now, we moved to the east. Uh, we had more a tradition of rock art. And I've just put one picture here of what is known as the map, which is in Yango National Park, just to the north of Sydney. And this was a meeting place for many hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. And it was a meeting place for groups that came from different areas. And there was a number of engravings which were thought and are thought to represent where those particular groups came from and that became known as the map. So this is just one way in which Aboriginal art in the eastern states, in New South Wales, uh, was um, uh, showing a, a cartographic format. Now let's get back to uh, the main topic. Let's talk about the autocratic governors. Uh, you'll notice that there are five autocratic governors and there are five democratic governors. So that comes to 10. Uh, and that takes us up to the period of uh, self-government. And it also leaves us a period between then and federation where there was another 10 governors. The autocratic governors began, of course, with Arthur Phillip. He was a, an amazing person. He planned the way in which he saw a free society develop in the longer term. I remember this was a jail of a thousand people and he saw something much better. Uh, his deputy, John Hunter, after a gap of three years when he was back in England, came back to become the second of the governors. He was blindsided by the fact that things had changed. Uh, what had been present for Philip had changed the New South Wales core, had taken a high level of control. Uh, MacArthur, John MacArthur, had taken a leading position in this and was uh, a very influential person uh, looking after John MacArthur. This was a time when the uh, uh, Sydney was, uh, and New South Wales from a Western viewpoint, was very much confined to the Cumberland Plain by the Blue Mountains and the, uh, the Great Ranges. After Philip came uh, King and Bly, and they inherited uh, a, a very uh, disturbed and distracted uh, form of governance. And in fact, there was a progressive destruction of governance uh, leading to uh, William Bly uh, having uh, been removed from his position uh, by the New South Wales Corps. Lachlan Macquarie came knowing what had gone on. Um, he came with his own force. Uh, before Macquarie, all the governors had been naval people. Macquarie was an army man, and he was able to control the New South Wales Corps, which the previous uh, three governors had not been able to do. 
Now let's look at the maps that relate to the various issues, events and activities of those governors. On the left hand side, you can see uh, a map that was actually drawn by Arthur Phillip and incorporated in uh, his book, which he wrote on a voyage to Botany Bay and published in 1789. Uh, those of us who uh, like to publish things would be very envious of the publishing record of these important people in the first fleet. As you can see, it's a very stylized and formal type of uh, town. It was based on his belief that had come down through the centuries on how colonial cities should be built. Uh, wide streets, uh, a, a particular orientation, which had some mythological sort of background, uh, but it was certainly going to be a very planned and sensible city. Now, by the time Philip uh, left four years later, uh, he actually drew what was going on. And you can see that the formalized city of Philip had become a cluster of dwellings around the tank stream, which was draining into Sydney Cove. And uh, right from the beginning, uh, the uh, structured concepts of Philip were in dire straits. While Philip was there, there were some other very entrepreneurial people who wrote books. And this is a map from one of them by Watkin Tench, who was a senior military person uh, who had already organized to write these books uh, and send them back. And he was uh, um, probably the most popular of all the books uh, that were written around the First Fleet were by Watkins Tench. He was very keen on exploring and he was responsible for not only identifying the Nepean River, but showing it was linked to the Hawkesbury River, which had been independently discovered. And you can see that the whole colony was confined by the, the mountain range to the west, which wasn't covered until 1813. I just draw attention too to the mapping of Sydney Harbour, which in fact was done by John Hunter a week after they arrived in 1788. Quite an extraordinary effort. Uh, and Hunter really uh, being a, a naval person and being a chartist was particularly adept at uh, creating hydrographic charts and created this very first chart of Sydney Harbour. Now, when John Hunter came back as governor, I remember he'd been in England for three years, he actually came back on the same ship that Matthew Flinders came to Australia. And he and Flinders became quite good friends. And the major contribution from a cartographic viewpoint that Hunter made, as he had before, was hydrographic. And in this summary map of Flinders, you can see that Flinders had changed the, the, the map of Australia. Uh, if you follow his course, uh, he wasn't too keen on getting involved where Cook had uh, beached the endeavour because of uh, problems with the Barrier Reef, but he did some fantastically good surveying around the Gulf of Carpentaria and around the bottom of Australia. But he left the rest for um, Philip Parker King, who came a couple of years later. He also uh, Flinders also, of course, with Bass, showed that Bass Strait existed. So these were really very important. And this was the map that was included in his atlas, which he published in 1814, just before he died. But I just draw attention to two factors on this particular map. First of all, we see Australia being used pretty much for the first time. And many people credit Flinders for introducing the term, of course, uh, that we know our country uh, as today. The second is, that the governors of those times had a pretty big area to be in charge of. New South Wales spread all the way to what is now approximately the Western Australian border, which you see is identified as New Holland. And the re reason for this is that England and Holland essentially inherited the territories that had been discovered and dominated by respectively the Spanish and the Portuguese. And England and Holland hadn't shared a, a particularly good past. They'd had four or five uh, conflicts. And when New South Wales was claimed uh, initially by Cook for uh, Britain, claimed it up to a line that was initially drawn in 1494 by the Pope uh, as the line of Tordesillas, which the Pope very conveniently divided all unknown lands between Portugal and Spain. And so if you inherited those uh, that, if you like, the tradition of a dominance of space, then uh, you, uh, for some reason, kept this same line. So that's why we have a, a border of Western Australia.
today. Now, under Governors King and Bly, uh, there wasn't really much done, but there was a very important trip, uh, and that was by a, a Frenchman called Baudin, who was theoretically searching for La Perouse, but in fact, it was a spy ship to an extent, and this is known as the spy map because you'll remember this was a time of Napoleonic Wars. And this particular map was drawn by his artist, Le Sur, and it's a very detailed map, as you can see, showing the structures within uh, Sydney in 1803. It really is much more than a village. It's uh, got some gallows, which was pretty important. And there was the development of a what's called a suburban system and a road off to Parramatta. Now, it was found not long ago that Baudin actually accompanied uh, this map with a statement back to the King of France saying, this is a very small English village, which we could easily take now. I suggest we do it because it may be a little later down uh, the line. It may be a lot more difficult for us uh, to take. Interesting. Now, at the same time, uh, there was a map done of the area. Again, this was the area you saw in Tench's map uh, up to the mountains because uh, it's before the mountains had been crossed. And you can see that there had been uh, a lot of grants given and the grants had been taken up in a pretty haphazard way along the main watercourses. Here is George's River from Botany Bay uh, and you can see the land in colours taken up around Sydney Harbour and along the Parramatta River and of course along the Nepean River up to where it enters up into the um, Hawkesbury. So uh, this was a big issue because Philip had been very keen not to give too much land away. Uh, that went uh, astray when the New South Wales Corps took over and uh, it meant that Macquarie inherited this uh, rather uh, disorganised and disarray of grants, which uh, many of which he actually reversed. This is the town that Macquarie left. Now, it's very different to what you saw in Lesseur's map. Uh, it, it actually was done in 1832. 1833 uh, by Thomas Mitchell, who was then the Surveyor General, a little after Macquarie left, but not much had changed. And you can see the streets have suddenly become much straighter. There is a semblance of the city we know today. Developments had begun to occur along Darling Harbour, which was providing support to the regional ships that were coming in, mainly with vegetables and food. And along Market Street, uh, it would bring the food to the uh, markets which were up here where Hyde Park is, and Hyde Park was about to become uh, a race course. So, uh, and Government House, we've got the original Government House, uh, and where Government House is today uh, is still uh, the Government House stables. Macquarie Street hadn't continued on uh, to Sydney Cove. So this remarkable map really has great importance because it was a watershed period between when maps were made in England or France, and maps were made locally. This is the very first map that was actually made and published in Australia. It's uh, 1833, it was a series of four maps associated with a dictionary that was put together by, or more a directory rather than a dictionary, by the then postal master, James Raymond, and it was published by Stevens and Stokes. One of quite a few publishing companies and printing companies that had already become present in the 1830s. So this was Macquarie's city plan. But Macquarie did much more than that. He encouraged exploration. And of course, the mountains were crossed in his time in 1813 by Blacksland, Wentworth and Lawson. And this is a map by John Oxley, who was then the Surveyor General. And it shows Oxley's attempts to trace the west flowing rivers, which he didn't do very successfully. And also his attempt to go north uh, discovering the Darling Downs and coming back to the coast near where Port Macquarie is today. Uh, so we're starting to see an extension. Of course, as soon as someone explored and discovered good land, the squatters would move in uh, with their sheep and take over, which became a big problem for subsequent uh, governors. The other important thing about this map is that it was done by Aaron Arrowsmith. The Arrowsmith family were the English map makers that took a particular interest in the colony of New South Wales and the other colonies in Australia and really put their mark 
on the quality maps published in England, really following the discoveries uh, that occurred by uh, Sturt, um, Oxley, um, and right through to uh, Burke and Wills and the western part of the country. So we now move to the democratic governors, which I've called a yin-yang uh, administration, because every time there was a rather severe governor, he'd be followed by a sort of milder one. And Thomas Brisbane, who came in 1821, who I think is a very special person, as you'll see, uh, was followed by uh, a much more severe Ralph Darling, uh, followed by a milder Richard Burke, uh, and Gipps, of course, was severe, followed by a milder uh, Fitzroy. So they came and they went, uh, and there was a bit of a yin-yang relationship in terms of the toughness of the governor. Uh, Thomas uh, Brisbane introduced something very special. He introduced uh, discussion, he introduced science, and a, a new um, contribution to the society of a slowly growing colony of New South Wales. He also came after Macquarie, and Macquarie, as you'll remember, wasn't very popular with the exclusives. Um, he could control them locally, but couldn't control the letters he, they wrote back to the colonial secretary, who at the time was Bathurst. And Bathurst sent out a chap called John Big, who was a, uh, a judge who took the side of the exclusives and uh, really demoted uh, the uh, concept and ideas of uh, Macquarie, uh, which was very sad, but he also came up with some quite good ideas that were very influential on the governors that followed. The first, of course, was how to control the out of control squatters that were taking up all the land that was being discovered to the west of the Great Dividing Range. Ralph Darling came up with the idea of controlling settlement by identifying where people could legitimately live, which of course made no difference to the squatters who already were well outside of that. And they were driving what was now becoming a significant wall economy. And by this time, even though you shall see the, there was very few sheep, it was still reaching the amount of wool that was being produced in Germany that was providing most of the wool at the time with Spain to England. Richard Burke followed and uh, he uh, realised that something had to be done about the squatters and came up with a concept of leasing the land for £10 a year, irrespective of the size of the, the property. Burke also uh, was there when the squatters had come across from Tasmania to establish Port Phillip Bay. And um, he was given the job or took the role of controlling that uh, because if he hadn't, uh, it would have got quite out of control. Gipps inherited uh, the Burke approach to squatting uh, in a much more severe uh, way. He was all about budget. He squeezed the uh, squatters. They wanted to do much more than he wanted them to, but he did give them the concept of uh, tenure. He was followed by Fitzroy, uh, and Fitzroy was the governor under which dicameral government uh, developed and which, uh, which would lead on to federation. And Fitzroy had this idea. He understood that federation would come. He was also there when gold appeared in 1851, and with gold appearing, huge changes would occur with the country uh, with great numbers. Now, I want to talk about a very, very interesting period of time. Governor Brisbane probably came to Australia because he was interested in science. He was an astronomer, a serious astronomer. And the map you can see, it was drawn by Alan Cunningham and comes from a very interesting publication called Geographic Memoirs on New South Wales that was edited by the Supreme Court judge at the time in Australia called Baron Field and published in 1825. And it included four contributions, which were transactions from the Philosophical Society of Australia, which is the precursor of our Royal Society of New South Wales. And what is really important about this, it brings together for the first time, the beginning of intellectual society uh, together with the governor of New South Wales. Uh, because in this same book, not only were there presentations by Field on Aborigines, Rumka uh, on astronomy, Alexander Berry, the ex-doctor who was a, a property magnet uh, on geology, and Philip Parker King, of course, who had become a very important surveyor 
of the coastline, but also meteorological observations that were actually made by Sir Thomas Brisbane, uh, together with some poems by Baron Field. And I genuinely think that the reason he published the book was so he could get his poems uh, published. But I want to show you something because I actually have a copy here of geological memoirs. And I didn't realize until I was going through this just yesterday that Brisbane's tables were actually here. So we have in this geological memoirs, Brisbane's table showing the mean temperature, pressures, really interesting, important meteorological data over a 12 month period, all published in exactly the same uh, journal as the first publications from the precursor for the Royal Society. And of course, Alan Cunningham was the end of the science dominated by uh, England uh, with the, the death of Banks. Banks ruled New South Wales from a distance up till 1820 when he died. And Cunningham was the first of the botanists that um, he brought that actually made Australia home. So it's a very, very important sort of point. Brisbane, of course, was an astronomer and he established uh, an observatory at Parramatta. And he brought out two astronomers to run it for him, Rumka and Dunlop. This is a very rare, a very extraordinary map. It's the first map of the skies from Australia with over 7,000 observations that were made from this Parramatta Observatory. When time surveys, meteorological data, as I've shown you, many other factors uh, were identified from this observatory. But this is a map that was actually made by Thomas Mitchell. I don't think it was ever published in any book form. Uh, there are only three copies that I'm aware of, and they came down through the Mitchell family. So it's the first picture of a map of the skies. Now, Darling then inherited, when he came, squatters that had moved outside his limits of occupation, and he commissioned Thomas Mitchell to make what I think is probably the most important map ever made. A bit hard to see on a screen like this, but it is a trigonometric survey of the 19 counties or the areas where people were supposed to live. Now, this was about 100 miles every direction from Sydney uh, and probably the most remarkable map in the world at the time over this type of area. It was produced over five years by many surveyors working for Mitchell. He sent his engraver that was engraved in Sydney to uh, strip some copper off the bottom of some poor boat that was stuck in uh, Sydney Harbour, but he didn't trust the printers in Sydney, so he took it over to England to get printed. Very important map. Now, during the time of Darling, another important issue came, again, initiated by Big. Now, I'm not sure how Big would go these days because he also was a significant shareholder in this Australian agricultural company. I didn't think you're supposed to do things like that, but certainly Big did. And the Australian Agricultural Company was owned by politicians in England, Big and the MacArthur's. And they took wherever they wanted, a million acres, so they happened to choose uh, poorly, perhaps, an area just north of Newcastle, which they then moved to the Peel River at Tamworth. But it became quasi independent. They ruled uh, their own land. They took little notice of the governor of the day, and there were quite marked conflicts between Darling and Parry, who uh, of Arctic exploration fame, who was running the company at that time. But it did have a lot of very important contributions, including improving the quality of sheep. So talking about sheep, I thought you'd be interested. This is a diagram I made showing the population of New South Wales and Australia. Here is the population of Sydney up to uh, just after 1900. And you can see in 1900, there was about half a million people. We're talking at the moment, we're back here in the 1840s where there are very few people. But look at the sheep increase. This is not half a million. This is going up to 100 million sheep by 1900. Just to give you an idea of how important wool was to the economy of Australia, 100 million sheep. In Burke, who was the next governor, um, Burke had to cope with Batman coming across from Tasmania and negotiating with Aborigines to take half a million acres of prime territory around where Melbourne is today and along the Yarra River. Uh, six weeks later, surprise, uh, Burke turned up and said no way and uh, abrogated the, uh, the, the, the deal that uh, 
Batman thought he'd made with Aborigines and took it all as crown land. But the map itself ended up in the parliamentary papers in England, and uh, it's the first map of Melbourne, albeit uh, not the Melbourne we know today. To give you a better idea of how the 19 counties looked uh, from the map you saw before by Mitchell, this is a map by the nephew of Aaron Arrowsmith, who we were talking about with that Ox Oxley map before. Aaron Arrowsmith um, bequeathed his company to, eventually to his nephew, uh, John Arrowsmith, who took a particular interest in Australia, and he started publishing his London Atlas in uh, 1834 and included up to eight or nine maps of Australia, which was in an atlas of 50 maps of the world, uh, indicated how much interest he had in this part of the world. And you can see by 1844, um, Mitchell had gone up the Darling, or part of the Darling, and the most of New South Wales was penned out to an extent. And this was where the, swatter, the squatters were. They'd come down uh, uh, by five years from Mitchell's earlier trip down into Australia Felix, around this northwestern part of uh, Victoria. 75% of Victoria were squatted within five years of that to give an idea of the timeline and the problem that the governor of New South Wales uh, actually had. The next governor was Fitzroy, and Fitzroy uh, was there when gold was discovered. And there are very few gold maps because they're all used. Uh, this is a, a very uncommon one showing how to get to the gold uh, fields from Melbourne or Sydney. Uh, there are various distances, um, and these maps uh, were, were bought by the thousands of people coming to Australia uh, after 1851 discoveries in both New South Wales and Victoria. And of course, it made a massive difference with a tenfold increase in population through the 1850s. Now, just to come back to Sydney, let's have a look and see how the structure of Sydney was changing. On the left-hand side, uh, you have an interesting map. Uh, it's interesting because it retains the um, Macquarie Sydney, if you like, even though it was made in uh, a, a few years later. But it also shows Darling Harbour with just a few um, wharves. Uh, but the other side of Darling Harbour, you can see the Glebe Peninsula and an area which is proposed to be subdivided. Now, this area was a grant that uh, John MacArthur had bought from uh, another person and it was now owned by his son who wanted to subdivide it. And these issues were, were so important that they became registered in the uh, Hansard of the British Parliament. Uh, and here is a picture of the uh, Glebe Peninsula showing the area uh, owned by the MacArthur's that he wished to um, subdivide. And subdivision was becoming important because Sydney was becoming congested. It was still a walking city, so people didn't have transport other than a horse, and they didn't. most of the workers didn't have a horse. So they had to walk into work. And at this stage, it wasn't even a bridge. Now, if we fast forward to 1852, the year after uh, gold was discovered, here is a map not published in England as the previous one was. This is published in Sydney by one of the many uh, publishers and printers, uh, Walcott and Clark. And you can see Sydney changed completely. Look at Darling Harbour, numerous wharves down the side, uh, a very busy wharf system, uh, exporting wool and importing food from the north and south coast of New South Wales. Uh, it became a very busy city. Uh, there's an extension to the south uh, where you can see the uh, dwellings and subdivisions that were going on. We now look at the second phase of New South Wales under governors. And this was after responsible government where you had a dicameral system with two houses. And, and so the, the input of the governor was somewhat diluted. Uh, there was uh, a shared system of governance. And even though he would retain the crown uh, responsibilities, basically things were run by the government and by now a council in, in Sydney. Uh, there were 10 governors uh, through this time, just as there'd been 10 prior to responsible government, and they ranged from Governor Denison uh, through to uh, Governor Beecham, and uh, he was present when Federation began. There, again, there was this massive increase in population, which I showed you uh, beside the sheep. Uh, Sydney became a nodal city, which meant that it was more managing its um, uh, hinterland and 
the wool being produced and to uh, increasing extent minerals and various other uh, products. Uh, suburban development had to occur because uh, Sydney couldn't cope with the numbers. Most people were living in the uh, inner city, but from 1855, there was steam travel and rail transport that uh, was moving uh, people uh, initially between Sydney and Parramatta. But by 1890, there'd been a domestic rail across up to Hornsby and down to St. Leonard's. There was no bridge, of course, at this stage. And in the rest of New South Wales, there was an extensive rail network that was covering over 550 miles by 1890. I mean, an extraordinary development uh, inspired by some very special people. The rural land had been under the control of squatters who were sheep people. They grew wool. Uh, after the gold rush and people uh, came back after uh, they found or didn't find gold, they were looking at smaller settlement and the idea of closer settlement became the dominant land issue right through uh, from the 1850s. Uh, and it was never ever satisfactorily uh, uh, sorted out. Uh, initially in the 1860s, uh, the uh, Premier and the Governor got together and said, well, let's have a selection system uh, under the Robinson rules uh, where uh, individuals could go and select from people, squatters whose lease had come up. Uh, that, uh, as you'll see, didn't work particularly well and it moved to a system of acquisition, uh, either voluntary or involuntary. I just drew attention to the fact that water, which is such a huge issue today, was always an issue in Australia. And New South Wales was a little late to get into artesian wells <clears throat> uh, and irrigation systems, but what might be of particular interest is that the Snowy River system uh, was first decided or thought about in 1880 when they were going to shunt the Snowy River into Lake George and then siphon it across the lower part of the Great Dividing Range into the Murrumbidgee system. But when they went back to do further surveys, there was no water in Lake George. Uh, and so that came to uh, an unfortunate end. But the idea was around from 1880. Selection, as I said, didn't work too well because the squatters weren't fools. Uh, they decided they'd use dummies and all sorts of tricks to actually arrange uh, selection uh, along critical parts of their uh, squatted area so that no one else could get past it. Here is uh, a large area that was uh, owned or run by squatters. Uh, here is the water supply. And so they used dead people or babies that hadn't even been born uh, to be selectors uh, so that they could block off the access of anyone else. So that didn't come up terribly well. And so the government in 1880s uh, commissioned Morris and Rankin to do a survey, and they came up uh, with a concept and idea that really you have to go to a, a more rigorous system of closer settlement, which involved acquisition of land. And I just put up one map, which happened to be part of the AA company, uh, we voluntarily gave up some of their land for a very nice amount of money, which they sold to the government, smaller properties that could be used by the wheat farmer, with wheat moving very much now uh, across from South Australia to New South Wales. And in fact, New South Wales became the dominant producer of wheat. Water was and has been and always will be a big issue. And this is an amazing program that began in 1906 with the development of a dam across the Murrumbidgee River here, the Barrenjack Dam, which produced water, which was four to five times the amount that's in Sydney Harbour. Huge uh, reservoir. And that, of course, led to the development of irrigation widely in that area. Just one example of the many programs that developed in the 19th century. I think more dams were produced around then uh, than we have in recent times here. Very sad. This gives you an idea of how the railways worked in the 19th century, very efficiently and very effectively. And you can see these lines going to Burke, uh, up into Queensland, uh, down into the south and to Albury. Um, so we now have a, a highly efficient network system transporting uh, mainly wool and wheat to Sydney, the nodal city, which would transport it overseas. So here we are 
the end of the century. And what did Sydney look like? Well, Sydney, if we look on the right-hand map, was a very congested city. Look at the, the amount of wharf space along the eastern side of Darling Harbour. Uh, we have a more formal bridge that's been built. Uh, we have access to harbours all around, uh, to bridge uh, wharves all around uh, the harbour and a very congested uh, city. It looks not too much unlike the city of today. This was produced by HEC Robinson, who'd become the first specialist map maker in Australia. And he also produced the first street guide in the 1880s. And here is his uh, street guide of Paddington. Uh, there weren't any cars, there weren't even bikes at that stage, but people were interested in having uh, maps of the suburbs that were developing. A, a second major producer of maps was uh, John Sands, an amazing family, it was a general printing business, but they produced a lot of maps. And this was a regional map around Sydney showing the suburban uh, development. And what I really like is the line showing how far you can send a letter from Sydney for one penny. Some of us can remember when it was only three and a half pennies to send a letter anywhere in Australia. Now, my last map is one which is also one of my favourites uh, for reasons those who know me know. I'm an immunologist and I'm very interested in epidemics. Here is a map of Sydney by my hero, who's John Ashburton Thompson, who brought public health to Australia. And he did amazing things in analysing an epidemic of the Black Death, bubonic plague, that came to Sydney in 1900. There were over 400 cases with over 100 deaths. And these red dots indicate the houses where the Black Death was found, uh, the bubonic plague. And what Thompson did was show that the flea from the rat that had suddenly become sick, jumping onto humans, was the conduit of this organism. And he changed the whole way in which the epidemic was managed by isolating the rat, not the human. And that had great implications, which sadly I don't have time to talk about today. But this was the map that changed Sydney because it led to a Royal Commission that led to a relook at the structure of Sydney. Uh, didn't quite come up the way some people thought it might, as I think we'd all agree, but it was certainly a reckoning uh, to get rid of the slums and to change the way Sydney was. So let's look at what we've been talking about. We've been talking about how governors relate to the events that occurred in New South Wales. And the way I've organised it here, I put up the four governors that I think really made a particular difference. Philip, who had a great idea and planned for that. Macquarie, who could see where that idea could be, uh, added humanity uh, and encouraged the, uh, basically encouraged the squatters and others to uh, develop rural product. Uh, they were associated with Hunter King and Bly, who uh, had difficult problems with the uh, New South Wales core, and they granted land. They created problems for the governors that came. And so everyone and his dog had a patch of land. After we moved from the Dem, uh, from the autocratic governors to the democratic governors, stimulated without him realising it uh, by Macquarie, uh, leading to the big report and big saying we really do need to have a legislature, which he thought would be uh, dominated by the exclusives. It didn't quite work out that way, but that's what big had in mind. And it began the democratic process. I think Brisbane was incredibly important because he brought a difference that we discussed and Fitzroy came at the end of this period of democratic governors to essentially bring in uh, self-government and uh, dicameral government. And uh, he anticipated an independence uh, in the format uh, of the type of country that we have uh, today. There were many other governors involved. Uh, I mentioned uh, there was Darling, uh, Burke and um, uh, Gipps. Uh, they were extremely good managers, but they were dealing with issues raised by big and trying to make those issues work, uh, not particularly effectively uh, because it was the people themselves that seemed to make this work. Uh, they were good governors in the sense they were good managers, but they really didn't contribute, I think, in the way in which Philip Macquarie, Brisbane and Fitzroy did. So thank you very, very much for your attention. Well, that was actually, that was really fascinating, Robert. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Bryn Hibbert, sometime 
president of the Royal Society. Uh, Robert and I are the last two people, as it were, standing in real real time here. So, hello, Robert. Hello, Bryn. Um, but while we've been hearing Robert's really fascinating talk, you know, he I, I was just about to say he could have gone all night, gone on all night, and he probably would have done if we'd have asked him nicely. Um, we, we've got a very nice lot of questions. Uh, so it's my duty to um, to start the conversation. And of course, this would have happened with ideas in the house where there would have been a round general um, discussion of, of, of what Robert's been, uh, what Robert's brought up, but we'll do our very best. Um, I'll, I'll kind of try and bring them together. Um, we have we have open we have fourteen open questions. Thank you very much to everybody uh, for for posting. Um, some are kind of technical, but I might just perhaps go through them because the first one comes from Jim Kehoe, who um, asks in that very early, wouldn't the, the eighteen oh three French spy map of Sydney been sent to Napoleon? So you know, did Napoleon ever have a, a fancy to set up? his store down here? Well, that's, that's a good question, uh, Jim. I don't know the answer because I've the only connection that I have between Napoleon uh, and Australia as such, uh, other than the fact that uh, Baudin named much of the uh, discoveries he made when he went around Australia after um, Napoleon and his wife, uh, was that Napoleon desperately wanted to go on the La Perouse expedition and was very disappointed when he was turned down but he did live a little longer. In, indeed he did. And, and I guess the, the, the other question which uh, Chris Sullivan asks um, is how, how, how did we interact with the Indigenous people uh, in Australia? So he asks, to what extent did our colonial cartographers collaborate with and or rely on traditional knowledge of our First Nations people in creating Western maps? Oh, I think, I think very much. Uh, when you read behind the scenes and look carefully at how uh, maps and uh, tracks were made, uh, they were very often following Aboriginal tracks. Uh, many of the main roads in Sydney were following Aboriginal tracks that existed. And of course, they became the roads that became the maps uh, that we know of of colonial and now state of New South Wales. Um, secondly, um, it's almost certain that Black, uh, Blacksland, Wentworth and Lawson followed Aboriginal tracks when they made their map crossing the Blue Mountains, which pretty much is the same uh, road that we go over today. And you'll find that nearly all the uh, explorers had good relationships with uh, the Aboriginal people that they had with them. They didn't always have good relationships with some of the Aborigines who thought that uh, there was a little incursion going on, but they had good relationships with the Aboriginal people they had with them. People like Mitchell, for example, was full of praise, uh, both for his convicts that were with him and for the Aborigines that accompanied him. So overall, the, the relationship was very good. And, and certainly the governor mentioned uh, um, the very important relationship with, with Flinders. So uh, by and large, uh, as I think people got to know each other, uh, they became uh, much, much more dependent on each other and learnt uh, from each other. And I, I think it's a, a, a confused story that people take what they wish from it, but my own interpretation is that, um, by and large, the relationships were quite good. And that, of course, began with Philip, who worked very hard to have good relationships in the way in which people uh, from Europe in those days did, uh, including his own um, spearing on Manly Beach, where he... Uh, refused to let the soldiers fire back at the people who speared him. Um, let me ask a question that I think Margaret Cameron Ashwood would have asked, um, who, if you remember, wrote a book called Telling yeah. Lies for the Admiralty. So where does Cook come into all of this and the the early maps uh, of, uh, of the coast and so on? Right. The This talk, of course, was post-Cook, but uh, Cook, Cook's great contribution was, uh, from a Western viewpoint, identifying the east coast of Australia. And if you look at uh, the 
the maps of the time, the difference between Cook's mapping and, say, the early Dutch mapping is chalk and cheese. Um, Cook was a, a remarkable surveyor, a remarkable scientist who introduced uh, so many different aspects to navigational science. Um, it, it's important to know that at the same time that he was travelling, uh, a Frenchman de Saville was in the area of northern uh, New Zealand and lost one third of his ship to, serve, uh, to scurvy. Cook didn't lose one person. I understand Banks uh, got a touch of scurvy, but he had his own personal lemon tree growing on the Endeavour, but not everyone could afford to do that. And as, as one does. Um, <laughs> well, we, we, we're doing well here. So if you, excuse me for interrupting. Um, so we've now got about 19 questions going. So let me, again, ask one from Lindsay Bottom. Um, is the Australian Agricultural Company, referred to by Professor Clancy, the same one that exists today and whose exports to China are currently under threat, as referred <laughs> to blah, blah, blah? Yes, yes, it is. But of course, it's a, a major agricultural company on the Australian share market now. And I think uh, I don't think there are too many bigs uh, involved in the ownership. And certainly it's not now owned by the, uh, the British Parliament as it once was. It's a fascinating the way in which uh, the, the autonomy of that million acres developed. Um, there were major clashes with the, the governor, who, of course, was representing the crown. Every time it happened, uh, an email, which I guess was a 12-month uh, job in those days, would go back to England, and of course the English uh, governor, uh, government would say, "Of course you must do what the AA company wants to do. Of course they can move their whole show up to Tamworth if that's what they want to do." So it, it's a, in itself, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating story, and it's a very important so, story in Australia. So, so when did we manage to feed ourselves? Well, I mean, uh, we really? probably became. Uh, we became self-sufficient probably after Macquarie um, in the time, in the 20s. Um, lots of things were happening about then. Australia was given permission to make boats a little bit bigger than a rowing boat so that they could develop a, a coastal service. Um, the Australians were becoming more adept to the climate. There was a much bigger um, free population. The convicts were becoming uh, much less in number. Uh, and uh, we were feeding ourselves pretty well. And you can, uh, except in 1940, 1840 at least, there was a major drought and a, a turn down just as the wool industry was taking off. And of course, that set up the the whole um, cycle of, of of drought and plenty uh, that dominated Australia in pretty much every sphere we look at. Excellent. Um, Christina Slade asks, um, I wonder why the area in northwest Victoria was generally known as Australia Felix? <laughs> well, of course, it was New South Wales in those days. Um, we, we like to point out to some of our friends south of the Murray. The, um, it was called Australia Felix because uh, Australia was taking on uh, as a name. Uh, this was uh, a term that was introduced by uh, Mitchell. And Felix related to the extraordinary um, agricultural potential that uh, Mitchell found. Uh, it's said that the squatters had no trouble uh, finding where Mitchell had described this wonderful uh, Felix of a, a country by following the, the actual marks of his dray. I mean, he, when, when Mitchell went on an expedition, it was quite an expedition. There were drays, there were horses. I mean, it was a huge huge effort. So it wasn't hard to follow, but it was basically Mitchell looking at a, a very uh, a wonderful piece of land that he could see for sheep and agriculture. Oh, well, here's now a very special question from our former editor of our journal, Michael Burton, who is watching us from uh, Ireland. Oh, hello, Michael. We're going to take you up on that offer one day of <laughs> moving over to see that great, uh, uh, that great uh, as astronomical uh, uh, thing of yours. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, the, the astronomical uh, observatory of yours is, uh, in fact, the oldest observatory in uh, Ireland and the UK and, you know, who knows, the Northern Hemisphere. We, but Michael's not the oldest the observatory. Southern Hemisphere. But um, so Michael is the, is the director of the observatory in Armagh, Ireland, and he writes 
fascinated to see the first map of the stars drawn from Australia. Brisbane's observatory in Parramatta had mostly been noted for observation of the return of the comet Enka, the second confirmation of Newton's theory of gravity the return of Comet Halley being the first. You say the map wasn't actually produced by the astronomers Rumker and Dunlap, though. Can you expand on this? Um, Rumker was, of course, the person who, uh, from memory, first saw the Inca um, Comet. And it, yes, it was an extremely important and it established a, um, a real pattern of comet observation um, that went on through the century uh, by essentially amateur uh, astronomers. Who, who did extremely well. Um, no, I, 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 I can't really answer the question. What I do know is that most of the observations were made by Dunlop, who came out less as an astronomer, but more as um, a technician to keep the equipment in good order. Uh, Rumpke uh, was an outstanding um, uh, observer and astronomer, and it, uh, he went back eventually to Germany and had a, um, a stellar so, so-called stellar career back in Germany. Sorry about that. Um, whereas Dunlop stayed longer and probably put most of the observations, the standard observations together. Uh, so he plotted them. And of course, it was all published in a, uh, uh, in, in a book. Uh, and it was from that, uh, that collection of, of sightings that um, Mitchell put together. Whether Mitchell actually drew the map, I don't know. He, t- he takes credit for it. But whether it was him or not, um, the a uh, person who uh, did the actual drawing of the map was uh, a person who Mitchell used for many of his maps, uh, including that remarkable map of the 19 counties. And um, he um, so much corralled this particular printer that he made him live at his house in uh, King's Cross. So uh, uh, it's uh, uh, quite an interesting, like all these, they're wonderful stories. Of course, and and we could go on all night, but we'll carry on. Um, Don Hector asks a, a rather pr- um, sort of practical problem. Uh, when was the first land title system introduced and what collection exists of maps recording them? Um, the the original setting up of land titles were, was pretty iffy. The, um, the, the first... Uh, surveys were were very poor and inadequate and not enough. Uh, And in fact, there was no proper recording of these really until Mitchell started taking charge of the Surveyor General's office. And at that time, there was no printing. It was all done by hand. Uh, And they had, I think, six people drawing these titles. Uh, Now, how they registered them, um, I, I, I suspect it was done by the Colonial Secretary in place, uh, who um, by by this time um, was uh, uh, a very important person who really established zoology as as a hobby. But um, they were all recorded, and but but not in any any great uh, format. It was really South Australia that developed a, a much better system with the uh, system that Torrens uh, developed. But that was about uh, in the eighteen thirty late eighteen thirties. I can't be absolutely precise about how they were formed, but certainly by the middle of the century, we started seeing regular parish maps and regular surveys. Most of the surveys were done by private uh, surveyors, uh, many of whom had actually been trained by people like Mitchell, worked for Mitchell, but no one worked for Mitchell for very long. Uh, They went into private uh, and um, did quite well. Gosh. Um, Stephen asks, is there any truth to the rumour that the colonial secretary stopped Sydney's streets being uh, widened because he didn't want the colony to be too comfortable as it was a penal colony. Oh, I'd argue with that. Um, <laughs> there was, there was, it's quite interesting because quite, I was talking about the yin-yang um, nature of a lot of the, um, uh, the, the uh, democratic, so-called democratic governors. Uh, it, it's interesting because that yin-yang correlated with the strength that those governors uh, felt about uh, it being a penal colony as opposed to a colony uh, for free people to establish a, a wonderful country. Um, I, the, the colonial uh, secretary he's referring to um, is, um, God, I've got a mental block. He, he was the chap who bequeathed his beetles to Sydney University and the museum there is named after him. Um, someone will remember. 
Uh, he was a tough guy and a very, very competent administrator, but whether he made uh, that, I, I just don't know. It would have been very hard to make those streets much wider than <laughs> what he did. Well, they're very, yeah, I mean, I think we're, I think now in thinking about coming from London, which has rather narrow streets, you know, the modern day, it's not bad having a bit of social distancing. Peter Caruso asks, in a sense, on, for, on from that, what was the catalyst for Macquarie to transition from traditional autocratic government to something new? I mean to say, what was going on globally at the time to allow this to happen? That is, to bring Macquarie to Australia in the first place. Well, Macquarie was sent to Australia because of great concern uh, as to the lack of control uh, by uh, King. Well, it began with Hutter uh, and then King. And of course, the crisis of Bly uh, was uh, really very concerning back back home in, in, in London. And uh, they sent out Macquarie, who had a, a quite a strong record as a, a person uh, who understood discipline and understood how things should be. And they realised that the New South Wales core was the centre of the problem. And so they sent Macquarie with an army, uh, an army rather than a naval group of, uh, of soldiers. And, and so he was able to control the situation. Uh, what catalyzed the sending out of Big, and it was Big in turn that catalyzed the changes back uh, in England, was the letters essentially from, from MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur realized he couldn't bully. Uh, Macquarie in the same way that he bullied the three predecessors of Macquarie. Uh, and so he just kept moaning and groaning and sending letters. Uh, I'm sure MacArthur was bipolar. Uh, in fact, I'm absolutely sure he was bipolar. And so he'd write the letters on a good day and feel depressed on the other. But he, um, um, it was him that really catalyzed Big. Big then catalyzed the government. What was going on uh, at the time was post-Napoleonic, I suppose. Uh, lots of things were happening. Um, it wasn't such a great time of change. I think it was the various circumstances. And it was the enlightened ideas of Macquarie that did get through, saying we really look need to be uh, much kinder to the ex-convicts and develop a, 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 much, uh, a much deeper sense of democracy. Well, that's good. Um, by the way, Alexander Maclay is the oh, yeah, sorry. Your secretary. Uh, and thanks uh, to Tony Stevenson for banging that on the, uh, the questions. Um, were there any women? Cartographers. Oh, there's been lots of women cartographers, but there weren't too many uh, in the colonial New South Wales. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think. I don't think there were any colonial surveyor women. Um, th there was some uh, science was very tough right across the board for for women, uh, certainly in colonial New South Wales, colonial Australia, and uh, really right up to uh, uh, World War II. Um, so I think the answer is. While today there are some fantastic women cartographers, uh, in those days um, uh, they uh, didn't have that sort of opportunity. It was a tough job being a – you weren't just a cartographer, you were a surveyor. I mean, you would go out for weeks and end uh, in rain. Uh, the story, for example, of the chap who, who did most of the topography of Tasmania, he'd go out for a month and uh, uh, have to shoot his food um, – and um, survival was was really tough. I mean, even um, uh, Mitchell died from pneumonia uh, on his uh, uh, his last trip. Well, I suppose it was his last trip if he died on it. <laughs> I guess it is. Um, uh, looking at that, we've had now twenty six questions, which I luckily am not going to go go all through. But it's interesting that. The, the, the areas that people are asking, um, we're coming back to this in, in indigenous question um, and to how, what was the relationship between indigenous map makers? And one question is, are there, in fact, indigenous maps left? I think you showed uh, one in your slides. Um, and, and how did the incoming uh, Europeans kind of assimilate those? And I think you've, you've, you've kind of answered that. Yeah. Um, there's, Sorry, please. I, I tried to show particularly uh, what I think is a remarkable uh, um, painting, which was ac actually part of a, a PhD thesis, and uh, showing how Aboriginal people have always seen topography uh, as um, in a very symbolic fashion. And if you look back through um, very early uh, engravings, rock engravings here, you can see it. Certain items such as emus had a great cartographic significance. 
Um, we know we see this in the northern and western parts of Australia, uh, and, and it's this symbolism. Uh, on many of the items, some very old charingas exist, which are these magic uh, um, uh, flattened pieces of, of, of stone that reflect um, the, uh, where secret men's areas are, um, the body paint, uh, sand paintings, uh, sanding um, uh, drawings. Uh, are, uh, the whole uh, Aboriginal culture is so topographic and land orientated, and, but it wasn't till the 1930s that Europeans understood that or learnt that Aboriginal people understood boundaries. And I, I just made a very small point of that, but it's a very big issue because it gets right down to um, ownership of land and, uh, um, and, and uh, gets away from the, uh, the fact that Aboriginal people were not people who wandered all over the place. They actually had uh, an identified, understood territorial uh, uh, attachment. Excellent. Um, I'm tempted to close it there, but I will just ask a quick question from Janice Reed. Um, Bowdown, we were taught at school, met Flinders in Encounter Bay in South Australia and, repeat, and reputedly lamented that he had been delayed in Tasmania catching butterflies and forfeited the opportunity to claim the territory for France. How much of the coast did he map and was this by way of laying a claim? Sorry, could you say that? Uh, so this is Bowdown. Yeah, what was the last? Sorry, the second last sentence. I just missed well, that. has he? How much? So, so did he claim? Did he manage to claim the territory or any of the territory for France? Obviously not, because we're here. Um, and how much of the coast did he map? And was this by way of laying a claim? So, well, what was Bowdown's kind of? Bowdown was very important. Um, he, of course, was the first of the, uh, or the second actually, of, of the great expeditions looking for La Perouse. I mean, that was the that was the uh, stimulus, but of course they had uh, many other ideas. They were always told to look for uh, land opportunities, but France had actually claimed the western part of Australia, the area which was to the west of the line of tortoisillus that I talked about. And uh, But France and England had very different ideas of claiming and having a, a sort of um, um, re respect, I think, for a claim. Uh, Eng the difference basically was England put soldiers there, uh, France didn't. Um, so while I, I think a lot of the areas that Baudin was looking at, he actually understood France had already claimed. Uh, and it was only when England got a uh, whiff of the idea that uh, France was getting a bit interested in the western part of Australia that it very quickly uh, sent Sterling um, around that area to make some claims and uh, put some soldiers there. Very interesting. Um, there's been a few questions about um, can we get, uh, where can we see the originals of your of your maps that you've shown today? And there was a question about whether that's in the Royal Society of New South Wales collection or what's in the uh, our collection. And I think I'll let us, so what we're hoping is that Robert will write his talk up for the uh, proceedings and journal of the Royal Society of New South Wales. And um, we hope to have on our website perhaps links to both original material and other things that we can uh, that we can look at. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Robert. Uh, thank you for your talk. Not for me to say, because we now hand over to Judith Wielden. I think oh, Stuart great. will... I just want to say one quick thing. Uh, there was a great paranoia by England uh, about France. And I guess that went back for four or 500 years. But um, even establishing uh, the colony in Tasmania was essentially because they thought uh, the, the French, who had actually had several expeditions in that area, uh, may just establish a colony. Because remember, there'd already been this type of dichotomy of colonies on the Falkland Islands. Mm. Excellent. Stuart. Take us away. Your Excellency, thank you for devising ideas at the House and for inviting the Royal Society to inaugurate the series. We've chosen themes that relate to the governors and government house itself as our first topics to reflect the importance of you, the governor of New South Wales, inviting the people into the house in a new way that values thinking widely, deeply, and with curiosity. You're welcome to us this evening 
reveal those same qualities in your own thinking. We approach the 200th anniversary in 2021 of our first governor, Thomas Brisbane's governorship. And next year will be the Royal Society's 200th anniversary as well. Not a bad achievement in the so-called new world. And as Brisbane valued the importance of science, thinking, and applying these to governing, he also supported the Royal Society by being our first president, in a sense, our founder. I see a nice symmetry in this balance of your ideas at the house and the, his governorship. And the Royal Society looks forward to you sharing in our bicentennial celebrations in 2021. In the meanwhile, we wish you well with ideas at the house and all your at the house events, and we'll take part with great enthusiasm. Without our audience and its participation, the Royal Society would be for naught. So I thank our audience who simply listened and thought about the ideas or who will continue the discussion at home, as well as those who took part in the question and answer session and presented their different views and gave depth to the discussion. They were well shepherded by Emeritus Professor Bryn Hibbert, past president of the Royal Society of New South Wales and now vice president. Our speaker, Emeritus Professor Robert Clancy, is an immunologist of no small repute, yet he presented as an expert in the history of maps. His broad mind is entirely consistent with the deep message that I take away from his fascinating lecture. Yes, maps are about where we are and where we have been, but they also show us who we are and where we might go next. While GPS may get you somewhere, it does not show you a beautiful work of art, like the meaningful and moving Aboriginal painting map, giving structure to the superimposing of Aboriginal mapping on the European style scene of the same place and showing us that we are now inseparable as one people, or a new view of history. We began to be a place called Australia, or a political reality versus human behavior. The map showed where the squatters should be, but they paid no attention to the map. Ornery Australians making up their own minds. Or an assessment of who we are as a people. When the gallows stands out on the spy map of our road to the suburbs and Parramatta, and thank goodness we left the gallows behind. Or where we are as a people and must direct our steps. We must understand not just where we are, but how to get there. And I think of Ashburton Thompson's epidemiology map showing how we must listen to science and let it guide our steps. This is advice from a hundred years ago for governance in a time of plague. And that takes us back again to the beginning and the Aboriginal representation, the map that speaks of our Australia. Thank you, Robert, for a deep lesson that the value of maps goes far beyond getting somewhere. We use maps to study how we see ourselves, reveal ourselves, and discover how we became Oz, Australia. Thank you for opening new worlds to us. And thank you once again, Your Excellency, for this opportunity we look forward to your next message to us at our 199th birthday celebration at the annual dinner online of the Royal Society next month. And especially we look forward to the next Ideas at the House when we will take a deep and personal look 
at Government House itself, our castle on the harbor. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>